How's it going, everybody? <laughs> oh. Hi, Javi and John and Junior and Rohit and Donald and Rohit again. What's going on? Any new watch acquisitions? Of course. Um, hi, Mr. Blue. Cat <laughs> Wait a minute now. Mr. Blue Catone. Cool name. Uh, and you got me live, too. Hi. How you doing, Clyde? Oh, boy. Um, any new acquisitions? I happen to have on one. Uh, this is uh, one of the watches, one of the kinds of watches I want to talk about today. It's a uh, Daniel Roth Metropolitan. It's all Metropolitan 24 Cities. I think that's what it, it's the, the whole name of it. Um, anyway. Uh, let's see. Hi, Hans. How are you? Blue Cat. That's it. <laughs> oh, hey, Bruce. How you doing? Oh, by the way, uh, Bruce, uh, let us know uh, when the punters are going to have their uh, their new time on. Okie doke. Um let me, this is sort of a transition from what we had this morning. Um, the 5 p.m. today. Okay, great. Uh, everybody listen up. Uh, we're over, we, I have a half hour window. Uh, and at five o'clock, uh, the punters are having, uh, they have a, a really good live show. So you don't want to miss that. Hi, Orange Hand. How you doing? Um, okay, uh, let me just sort of start off with what um, I I think I have have worked out, and some other people have too. Now I'm going to start with this guy because I think it was one of the first ones we we got. This is a Roger Debuy Easy Diver, and uh, these watches were made in the early part of the 21st century, uh, maybe the last few years of the um, of the 20th century. And there was a period, and it, it was almost like a magical period from about 2000 to 2010. And during that time, you had all of these guys who are extremely talented. Uh, they were in, I think, uh, ranging age from about forty ish to maybe fifty ish during this uh, during this period. So they're fairly expensive. They had different types of experiences as um, in in terms of doing different things uh, in watchmaking, but they were very independent, and they become <laughs> found out. They've become sort of a, a a focal point for a lot of collectors, and they there's been a lot of misunderstanding. So so I'm going to talk about it, um, and some of the things we can we can learn from it. Maybe find some uh, good things. Hi, Chrono Unique. <laughs> hey, Javier Vega. How are you? And Forbin guys. Uh, Forbin, I think I got an email from you, and I haven't replied because I, I changed emails, and I'm getting out all of that squared away. So if you sent me an email, I'm, I'm still digging them out of an old server, and I'm trying to get them into my new one. All right. Uh, so uh, let's talk about this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, uh, my Easy Diver as as an example, by Roger Dubuis. The movement is by Roger Dubuis. And you can, you know, it, it's got a, a big gold rotor and everything else. And I didn't see any any other kind of base to it. Sometimes, a lot of times, there'll be a base. Now, the sports watch, and again, we're talking, gee whiz, this is going on 20 years ago. Um, late 90s, but mostly and sort of think of it is during the aughts, uh, the first decade. So much stuff was going on then. So 
all of these guys were they, they were doing two things. One on the, they were coming into their own in terms of having made some really incredible uh, watches themselves. For example, I think it's try to get the dates right on this thing. Right around 1989, I believe, uh, Daniel Roth uh, with, who was it? Um, the Chayume brothers took over Brigay, which was in pretty bad shape at the time, and sort of brought it back to life. Uh, Chayume went, uh, the, the brothers uh, were trying to do some fancy stuff financially and ended up in the soup. So I think maybe it was 89 when uh, when that was over and Daniel Ross decided, okay, I'm going to start my own business. And in order to do that, they almost have to act like, you know, the old fashioned patrons back in the old days, they'd have a patron of the arts. And so he'd support an artist. And I, I think a similar kind of thing was going on with certain watchmakers. And I'm trying to think that there was a place called the hour or something uh, in uh, Singapore. And that was the money that uh, supported Daniel Roth. Now, what he what he did was in order to um, have a an affordable watch, he used as a base other people's movements. But he did a lot of work on some of them, not all of them. Uh, for example, on this one, the uh, this is called the Master uh, Chronograph by uh, um, Daniel Roth. This one essentially is an El Primero uh, in, in a case. And I think there were four things that Roth added to it, but pretty much uh, is an El Primero. Now, an El Primero movement is a nice movement, and it's not an inexpensive one. It's not a really cheap one. And so this, this, was, how, this was how he was able to do the chronograph. Now he could have gone with you know some version of the seven seven fifty, but for whatever reason he decided not to, but to go with with this other one. Uh, this one, on the other hand, on the Metropolitan, uh, it doesn't even have a second hand on it. It's just the uh, hour and the uh, uh, minute, and then it has some other devices here that point to one city or another, uh, and either AM and PM. And then he has something that I guess was a big deal at the time. And this was to set it up so you could account for daylight savings time. Okay, so, but at the base of it is an ETA 2894. Now, the difference here bet between that is the, you know, what they got with it. This one I had talked about this morning a little. This is the Christian Vanderclaw. This is another guy who's famous. Watchmaker, his um, uh, astronomical watches are fantastic and famous. And uh, so I thought, well, this would be a great one for a moon phase. And, and it has been. It's been a wonderful watch. Uh, but essentially what it is, it's another ETA 2892A2. Um, and with the claw version of the of the rotor put on it, which is, is no big deal. And um, but just sort of putting the the module for the uh, for the moon phase on top of it. Okay, well, um, these watches could be sold for a lot less than the other kinds of watches that he had been making, and and throughout there was um, a lot of that going on. Now, some of the movements were um, older ones by uh, Lamania, for example. And uh, Lamania, as you probably know, was a base movement for the uh, Omega uh, moon watch that went to the moon. And so we're, we have these things, Hourglass, uh, Mr. Blue Cat, that's it, was the Hourglass who was sort of the patron behind um, Daniel Roth. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so so those are the situations we have. Now, 
here's the thing for collectors. If if you go to get a Daniel Roth watch right now, and you know you uh, they've got a new name for uh, their business now because Bulgari owns the um, name Daniel Roth. The it, it'll cost you over a hundred thousand dollars for for a single watch, and he only makes like one, two, three, possibly a year. Doesn't make very many, and uh, you know, like Roger Smith getting wine, and you know, you may have to wait a while. Um, but on the other hand. Here we, we have this, you know, really major talent that is available to us in the sense that we can get a part of it for something that's more affordable. Now, a few years ago, there were a lot of these things that were great deals. I mean, really great deals. They were not only a, a wider variety were available, but also for, for great prices. And I mean, just in the last, good grief, few weeks, um, a few months at the most, they whoop, up they went. And, and I think in part it's because collectors are beginning to discover them. And also, I think they're beginning to discover more interesting watches. Uh, and, and this isn't to say, you know, that there, there are a lot of interesting watches. Uh, today at uh, High Horology Lounge, they put up a... Um, Oh, what was it? It was a Rattrapont by um, Bastion Constantin. I mean, it's really a cool watch. But two things are, again, they're all going up over forty, fifty thousand dollars now. I mean, I mean, you know, not too long ago, twenty thousand dollars would you could, you could get a you know an FP Jorn and all kinds of things. Probably a, a high end. In fact, a high end, um, a low end. Uh, Gronfeld was twenty nine thousand, but not anymore. You can't you can't get near them for that. And so these are sort of these other ones that have have been found and been and been looking at them. Hi Joseph, how you doing? Marco, how are you? Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, a stinker. Oh, we'll use that word. <laughs> rancher is a badge of of ignorance calling watches that i think is a badge of ignorance this is this is what the the term one of the things that uh clyde and i had uh had been talking about is that people who are running around who know nothing nothing and i mean almost nothing about watches or what's inside the watches have been, oh, well, that thing is is no good because of X, Y, and Z. And, and I think this is this is something I think that has has been sort of a bugaboo for a while, is that a watch with an ETA in it must not be a very good watch. Now, the difference between, and, and this is sort of the backstory on that thing, is that the Putting an ETA into a watch is not a bad thing, but if you're doing it and then saying, well, this is a high horology watch, then that is. That's not, I think this is where they got a bad reputation, is that here you put a very expensive movement in, you put a lot of resources into it, there's really great finishing on it. And then you you stick in a I mean the, the kind of stuff that IWC and Breitling have been doing, uh, 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 Tag Heuer, a lot of the other ones. I mean they're trying to be something that they're not. Panerai, of course, they got into a huge amount of trouble. Well, the biggest problem that I saw in that was that it, the it was almost automatic if it had an ETA, it must be a crummy watch, uh, and sometimes it was. <laughs> it's, and when they had a uh, a back to it that nobody could see what was in it, uh, you know, you, you've got, you know, they could do anything they want to it, and uh, it, it wouldn't look very good, perhaps. So uh, this be, this is also part of the bugaboo. This is uh, this is the back of my, uh, God, I keep forgetting the name, Daniel Roth. Okay, this is one. Now here is the other one, and you can you can see the movement in the um, in the chronograph. 
but you can't see it in the um you can't see it in this one okay so all of these people were making all of these assumptions about it oh well it must be this because he used this in another one it's got to be a gerard perigo or it's got to be a lamania or yada 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 came up with all kinds of things but none of them had looked all they had to do was to look and it was an it's it's an eta and when i took the back off there was a rotor and the rotor had the information about the ETA. Uh, and plus it had some very nice own gloss on it. So, you know, you, you don't have to have it looking pretty if you got a solid back. But if you do, it's an indication of some kind of professionalism. I mean, really a lot more than, you know, all you got to do is, is take a look inside. Now here, uh, what they did, uh, they put a you know really nice <laughs> rotor on it with their uh, their Claude. Uh, that's Van der Claus. Uh, the 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 sun with the rays are really claws. Sort of an interesting kind of thing. And then on the um, the Roth, um, not only that they put in a gold uh, rotor, but the movement was a Roger Dubuis. So and anyway, that but this is sort of the kind of thing. Is is to trying to figure out? Okay, well, they, they have an ETA in it. What's you know? Is that is it any is it any good? All right. Well, that's this is this is what I sort of wanted to talk about finding them and finding out who's using them. Well, you don't have to you don't have to look very far. I've already mentioned Christian Vanderclaw, mentioned uh, Daniel uh, Roth. And uh, Rod, well, not Roger Dubuis, but at least in those, some do, some don't. But the other ones, there are some really cool watches by Antoine uh, Prezuzio, by uh, Vincent Calabrasi, by Sven Anderson, that were made for as affordable watches that have ETAs in them. And, and so, but one thing I, I suppose that still bothers me. Uh, when you have a, um, you know, something like this with a Nel Primero in it, and you call the movement a DR400, it's sort of like, come on, you know, all you got to say this is, uh, just tell everyone, say it's a um, El Primero 400, and eh, we did some stuff to it, so I'm going to call it a DR400 or something like that. But is it a bad watch? No. Uh, in fact, I think I almost would rather have an El Primero in there than something that um, Roth tried to cobble together. You know what? To all try to put something in there with it. Uh, so, so these are the kinds of things I think that I, I, I think I would rather have. There are a lot of oh, let's take Breitling. Breitling with their B O one, I think, uh, movement is 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 their in house movement or it's the one that they develop uh, jointly with uh, Tudor. Okay, is it that good? That's, I think, the question that needs to be asked is, well, how really good is it? Uh, these comments are not frying pan worthy. What's what's going on? <laughs> okay. Hi, Truman. Uh, Daniel Roth is not located in Bloomington, Indiana. Okay. Did anyone say he was? <laughs> They're probably, you know, Daniel Roth, a lot of times if I Google it up, some other guy named Daniel Roth comes up. Hi, Paul. How are you? Uh, in a moment of weakness, I bought a Hamilton Ventura. Oh, what about a Hamilton Ventura? That's an Elvis's watch. I'd love to have one of those. See, that's another thing, too. Um, where is it? Here it is. This one, this is this is my outlaw, part of my outlaw collection. And it's one that's still in an, an enigma because it's a shape movement by uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Jacquet. And it's most of the people who are pretty sure they know what it is say, oh, it's a ETA um, Pazu 7001. Okay, that's sort of a cool thing. And, and, and I have two of these so far, and uh, perhaps we'll be able to collect another one. So these is what I'm trying to say. It's really broadening what 
collectors can collect simply by knowing what's available that's interesting. Hey, Eric, how you doing? ETA 2092 actually is a very, very good movement. You are right. But this is the other thing, too, that I, I'm learning is that there are four different uh, types of ETAs. There's a standard one. Uh, then they have what they call e elaborate. Then they have the top. And then they have uh, the, uh, the chronometer level. And the the two the top one and the chronometer are the same in terms of the equipment. I mean, the kinds of things they're putting in them, uh, but the chronometer goes through COSC, and that's really the difference between the two. Did Bulgari mess up Daniel Roth, or or was it a, is that a good arrangement? Daniel, to me, Bulgari squandered. They just squandered not only his talent but also uh, Gerald Gentis. Apparently, there was some guy at Bulgari at the time who was sort of um, that Roth didn't like at all. And just he was one of these guys. I think he treated Roth like, OK, we bought your company and now you're one of our employees. So we want you to do this, that and the other thing. I mean, Jesus, here they, here they got this great talent. They could have treated him right. And but you know, after a year, he left and said, You know, heck with this. And so he, they started a company called God Jean Nicholas, something or other, that was named after uh, Ross's wife and kids. And um, you know, so <laughs> that was so now, if you want a Daniel Roth, you got to get one from this other company that'll cost you a hundred thousand dollars and you have to wait a year while he makes it for you. Uh, that, that's pretty much it. Um, Okay, P Pazu is my drinking game. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, Foreman. Um, yes, yes. This, that's another point that um, Rancher pointed out. The the best one, both of the the, the one that's called the top and the uh, chronometer version of the ETA, uh, both are adjusted to five positions. Uh, the five positions they're they they're from the kama sutra uh at least that's what clyde told me okay now they have something like this you got the uh um crown up crown down uh crown to the left crown to the right and then do si do and you turn around there's there are five different positions i wrote them down somewhere i'll dig them up but it's um that thing why are pseudo in-house movements such as Val Fleury regarded as bad as ETA? Uh, Val, um, I don't know who regards it that way, first of all, okay? The Val Fleury is sort of an interesting phenomena in making in-house, making a, uh, you know, creating a, um, creating a movement making for a group. A, a watch group, the Richemont group. Now, I was trying to find out about it, and that thing looks like a a, a bunker somewhere. <laughs> they had some pictures of it, and the pictures were taken from far away, and you see this black building down below, and it's like, you know, there it's it's a some kind of secrety thing. So, but you know, people say, well, it's awful. Well, I. I don't know if that's true or not. I think they used one of, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Caspi's movement that she made with Cartier, and then they used that as a base, and then Piguet used it, and then um, Vassaron Constantin used it, but Vassaron Constantin said, well, they did so much to it, it really wasn't a Val Fourier anymore. Uh, so I, so that's, that's another interesting thing. And... Um, when you say as bad as, it might be as good as ETA because you 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 talk about the top and the uh, uh, chronometer level. You got some you know some pretty good things in there, and, and you've got more stuff going on. And I think one of the things that as collectors we can do, we can try to figure out if there is an ETA, what version of it is. Just like with the uh, El Primero, there are a lot of different versions of the El Primero. 
uh, 400, I think, is the original version of it. And then they, they made all of these other ones. Um, I, I'm afraid it's 5 hertz, and I'm sort of a low hertz kind of guy on that. Hi, James Kahn. Uh, Louis Arad, Virlini Hammer, watched earlier this year. That watch, now that's an interesting kind of thing. This is, uh, that's a great example, by the way. Um, I tried to get one of those in an auction and whoop, boy, they were gone. Those things were gone so quickly. Um, Louis Arad is not one that's known for high end stuff, but somehow I think that um, Vianney Halter decided, well, you know, this might be a way that he can sort of start doing some things, and I hope they do more of those. Uh, my Ulysse uh, Nardine has an ETA uh, 2892, uh, Jacques Baum. Boy, I don't know who Jacques Baum is. Is that part of um, Baum at Mercier? Uh, they, have, you know, they have some kind of these things. Uh, let's see. Daniel, what's up, Han? Somebody who repairs for uh, Federico at Del Rey, former employee at Longa, says that ETA regular can perform as well as ETA high grade, just difference in mostly finishing. Well, he's wrong, okay? I, I did, did some digging. The, the difference between the what they call the Olabre and the top, uh, not only does the one at the top have better... Um, better adjustments, they also um, have a better uh, spring, both a, um, a mainspring and a hairspring that are more variable to heat. So uh, there is a difference. And, and it, it, it's something I think that watchmakers are aware of. So you've got five uh, regulations to it. Plus, you have an, an upgraded, uh, in, instead of a um, Navarox hairspring, they have something called an Anacron. And so there, there are some differences. Now, um, from what I've seen and read from about watchmakers, they love ETA. And there's a good reason for it. They, have, um, they can get parts. That's the biggest thing. They can get parts for it, and that's uh, you know, and also the two they're familiar uh, working with it. Hi, Velvia man, how you doing? Zenis found it so scary that they uh, neutered it before they put it into Daytona. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> that's funny. Oh, let's see. Hi, Thomas, how you doing? Um. Okay, let's see. Um. Okay, everybody's greeting. That's a good thing to see. It's frying pan time, I'm afraid. It's 4.30. Now, listen, it in a half an hour, the, um, oh, God, uh, the pundits are, are, no, not the pundits, the punters. The punters are having their, um, their live streaming video, and uh, everybody go, I've got to go uh, working on this project putting together a vanity so uh i'm gonna be i'm gonna miss it but everybody else enjoy it junior let's see <laughs> yeah you guys have a good time there too you guys take care hi koji and um see you next week <laughs>